Well, what a joy it is to be able to come back this morning after we had such a wonderful evening last night and to be able to continue to look at this theme on the holiness of God. And as I start, I want to express again my gratitude to the Australian Fellowship of Bible-believing churches. I just love the name of that uh, association uh, for inviting me and such a kind invitation, and I'm so grateful uh, to be here with you. And I do want to express my personal thanks again to Dr. Andrew Cordes and to be able to stand here in this pulpit where I know he ministers the Word of God so faithfully right now in the book of Ephesians, uh, going verse by verse through that wonderful book. Uh, Sinclair Ferguson once told me, every church needs to be Ephesianized. So, uh, I know this church is being Ephesianized, uh, whatever that means. So, uh, uh, what a joy. And I love this orchestra. Uh, I don't know where they went, but uh, they were right. <laughs> they were there a minute ago. I know. I saw them. Um, and so, I just want to announce I am taking them back to the States with me. <laughs> so, parents, you can come if you want to see your children again. Uh, they, they have just done such an incredible job. So, praise the Lord. And what a marvelous turnout this morning on a, on a Saturday morning to gather, to look together into the Word of God, and it's with a sense of anticipation that I ask you, invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Psalms, the Psalm 2, which is the Psalm we'll be looking at here tomorrow night in the evening worship service at Emmanuel Baptist Church, but I, I want to begin launching our focus on the holiness of God by directing our attention to these opening verses in Psalm 2. Last night, we looked in Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus on the holiness of God, and I'm having to now uh, fast forward uh, to the book of Psalms and to the prophets. Um, After the break, we'll look in the Gospels and in the Epistles at the holiness of God, and we'll end up in the book of Revelation. But for now, the Psalms and the prophets. In Psalm 2, beginning in verse 1, why are the nations in an uproar? Why is the United States in an uproar? Why is Australia in an uproar? And the peoples devising and scheming and plotting and conspiring, an empty, vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand. The president of the United States takes his stand. The prime ministers around the globe set their jaw and take their stand. And the rulers Take counsel together, G7, against the Lord and against His anointed, the Meshua, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. They take their stand against the law of God, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart. We don't want to be tied down with the moral law of God. We want to go our own way. We want to do our own thing. We want to trash the law of God and cast their cords from us. We want all moral restraint to be removed. We want tolerance. We want freedom. We want anarchy. Verse 4, he who sits enthroned, high 
and lifted up, exalted, surrounded by the cherubim and the seraphim. He who sits in the heavens laughs. It's not the laughter of humor. It is the laughter of derision at the insanity of the creature to think he could rise up against the Almighty God and replace His design for the family, and replace His design for marriage, and replace His sense of right and wrong. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them as though belittling them. You puny little dust think that you would rise up against me? All the nations of the world combined are but nothing. The Lord scoffs at them. Then He will speak to them in His anger. Holy God, and this is true of every generation of human history. It was true at the time of the crucifixion of Christ. It will be true of the generation alive at the end of the age when Christ returns. But it was true the first generation with Cain and Abel. It is true of every generation to think that they can throw off the moral, holy restraints of Almighty God. He will speak to them in boiling hot anger because He is holy God and terrify them in His fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my King, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Judge of judges, the Lord Jesus Christ, His anointed one. I've installed my king upon Zion, the heavenly Zion, seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, my holy mountain. God's holiness remains untouched by man's unholiness. Culture is perishing. It is unraveling like a cheap sweater before our very eyes. Society is changing and devolving. It's not evolving, it's devolving into lower depths of depravity, things unlawful to even mention in public. The world is, when a, is in a swirling cesspool of iniquity. But on high, God has seated His King on His holy mountain. There on that holy mountain 
is nothing but pure, unvarnished, undefiled, unadulterated, moral perfection. God Himself is holy, holy, holy. God's Son is holy, holy, holy. The Holy Spirit is holy, holy, holy. And God is the executor of His own administration, towering over the affairs of providence. And His every decision is holy and flawless. And there is coming holy judgment upon a Christ-rejecting, God-blaspheming world. This planet is spinning through space and is on a collision course with holy God. The holiness of God represents the very essence of all that God is. It is the comprehensive attribute. It is the sum and the substance of all that God is. Every attribute of God is marked by, defined by His holiness. His power is holy power. His truth is holy truth. His love is holy love. Everything about God is holy. And from cover to cover in the Bible, we see the holiness of God. His will is holy. His ways are holy. His motives are holy. His name is holy. His character is holy. His pronouncements are holy. Everything He does is perfect. He never needs a second chance. He never needs a second opportunity to make it right. He always gets it right from the beginning. And this world is so out of sorts with the holiness of God that for us to look at the holiness of God almost causes us to lose some sense of equilibrium. We're so out of sync with the holiness of God. So I want to walk through a few psalms with you. I want to remind you of what holiness means. There are three, there's a threefold, three-tiered understanding of the holiness of God. The primary meaning of the holiness of God is separation. That God is separated from His creation. He's on an entirely different level from us. He is high and lifted up. He is exalted in the heavens. There is a chasm between holy God and unholy man that is an, an uncrossable chasm by man. And as God is enthroned in the heavens, He is radiant in His splendor. He is dazzling in His glory. He is regal in His reign. He is royal in His righteousness. 
He is shining brighter than 10,000 suns in the sky above, and not a one of us with human eyes could even look upon His holiness and live. That is why when we go to heaven, we must have a glorified body. We must have glorified eyes to even be able to look upon Him and survive. We must have a glorified body to even be in close proximity to this burning, blazing glory of God in heaven. We could not exist in this body in the presence of God. And if Jesus Christ right now walked into this room in our corruptible body, we would all faint and collapse to the ground. Not a one of us would even approach Him. He's transcendent. He's a cut above us. He is holy other than us. That's the primary meaning. The secondary meaning is moral perfection. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. His every thought is pure. His every motive is pure. His every action is pure. His every work is pure. Everything that God is, that God says, that God does is without moral blemish. And then the third level of understanding the holiness of God, therefore, because of the first two, therefore, God hates all that is unholy. There is a revolt within God Himself against all that is unholy. God is not morally neutral towards that which is unholy. And God loves holiness. And He loves holiness wherever He sees it in the earth. And He is filled with vengeance and righteous indignation against all that He sees that is unholy. That is what it is to be God. So in Psalm 5, we see some very strong statements. And you, you need to understand that the book of Psalms took a thousand years to write. The first psalm to be written is Psalm 90, 1,400 years before the coming of Christ. The last psalm to be written is Psalm 126. It was written 400 years before the coming of Christ. And you can do the math that there's a millennium in between the first and the last stanza. They are not arranged in chronological order. There is a reason for the order in which these psalms are found. Tomorrow I will preach on Psalm 1 in the morning, Psalm 2 in the evening, because those are the two most important psalms in the entire book of Psalms. They are front-loaded for a purpose and reason. And we're going to look at Psalm 5, Psalm 7, Psalm 9, and Psalm 11. And what I want to draw to your attention is that these are intentionally front-loaded. These are not hidden in the back of the Psalter. The compilers intentionally place these on the front doorstep of coming into the book of Psalms such that you and I would never miss seeing these psalms. They rise to a very high level of importance by their position in the Psalter. 
And so as we look at Psalm 5, beginning in verse 4, for you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. It's a very strong denial. It's a negative denial. God, you cannot delight in wickedness. Holy God cannot be indifferent to sin. He is not a stoic sovereign. No evil dwells with you. God's holy mountain is for that only which is holy, the holy angels, the holy people of God who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, the holy trinity. There, there, there are no unwashed sinners in heaven. There is not one fleck of defilement in the corridors of heaven. The inner sanctum and the palace and the throne room of heaven is perfect. No evil dwells with you. Verse 5, the boastful, referring to those who are self-righteous, who are self-exalting, who are self-promoting, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes. They will not stand with acceptance before God. They will be utterly rejected and cast away and cast down. The end of verse 5, you hate. God is a God of love and God is a God of hate. There cannot be love without hate. You hate all who do iniquity. And please note the wording in your Bible. It is more than just that God hates iniquity, it is that God hates the person who does iniquity. God does not send sin to hell, God sends people to hell. You hate, you reject, you loathe, you despise. God must because He's a holy God. All who do iniquity. Verse 6, you destroy those who speak falsehood. You, you utterly obliterate. The Lord, the end of verse 6, abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. The word abhors means to, to loathe, to despise. He abhors the sinner man of bloodshed, who breaks the commandment, who takes another life, and then with deceit tries to offer his own explanation and excuse as to why he has taken another life, perhaps in abortion. Oh, this is an aspect of the holiness of God that sounds so foreign to our ears. This is a long way from smile, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Verse 7, but as for me, one who lives a totally different lifestyle, one who is on a totally different path, by your abundant loving kindness, I will enter your house. And it is the abhorrence of God against the sinner man that causes the diamond of His grace and abundant loving kindness to shine so brightly. This is what puts amazing into grace, to know that God hates the sinner, yet extends grace and mercy to the sinner whom He hates in the person of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that His grace triumphs over His justice. Otherwise, grace, we would just yawn at it. 
Even the elect of God are under the wrath of God before they come to faith in Christ. But as for me, by your love, abundant loving kindness, I will enter your house and find acceptance in your house at your holy temple, referring to the heavenly temple where God dwells in the holy of holies. I will bow in reverence for you. Each and every one of us here today must bow in reverence before the holiness of God that we have received what we do not deserve. We deserve hell. God has granted to us heaven. God demonstrated His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Before I asked my wife to marry me, I went to a jeweler to buy an engagement ring. And he stood behind the counter and he pulled out a tray with diamonds. And he placed them in front of me. Nothing caught my eye, they looked very common. There was no brilliance to them. I was unimpressed. It's not the right one. He said, wait a minute. He reached under the counter and he pulled out a black velvet pad. And he put it on the counter and with tweezers, he picked up a diamond and placed it on the black velvet pad. And suddenly that diamond burst into glorious color and every light above in the ceiling was sucked in and through the diamond and it came alive. It sparkled, it dazzled before my eyes. I said, I'll take that one. The black velvet backdrop is God's holy hatred of sinners in their sin who are under the wrath of God. And the diamond of His grace and the diamond of His mercy will always appear to be bland until you put it on the black backdrop of God's holy hatred of sin and sinners. And then, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretched, ruined, perishing, hell-bound object of divine anger What we're looking at here is necessary to have a proper understanding of God and grace and glory. Come to Psalm 7. Again, please note the placement of Psalm 7. It's not Psalm 147. It's not Psalm 137. It's Psalm 7. After talking in verse 6 about the anger of God, and the word anger in the Hebrew means actually nose or nostril, and it is the <laughs> heated anger of God towards all that is unholy. We come to verse 11. God is a righteous judge. 
The word righteous here indicating that God can never issue a judgment that is flawed. It all conforms perfectly to His equity and His justice. Everything is measured by His own holiness. We're not measured one against another person, and the average morality of those in Australia becomes the standard, and we're all measured against that. No, the standard is the absolute flawless, perfect holiness of God. We've all been weighed in the balances and found wanting. God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation. That means divine anger every day. Not just at the end of the age, not just at the time of the second coming, not just at the time when the great tribulation occurs, not just at the final judgment. No, God has righteous anger and indignation every single day because there is sin every single day, and there are sinners who are not under the blood of Christ every single day. So, what happens if a man does not believe? Verse 12, if a man, a sinner man, does not repent, does not turn from his sin and turn to God whose arms of grace are being extended, He, God, will sharpen His sword. No apology being made here. A sword is an instrument of death. A sword is an instrument to inflict great harm. And when God sharpens His sword, the result is eternal destruction. The psalmist continues in verse 12, he, God, has bit his bow and made it ready. He has put his fiery arrows of divine justice and judgment into the bow. It's already loaded, and it's already aimed at the sinner man, ready to be released. Verse 13, he, God, has also prepared for Himself, He will not designate this even to the angels. He's prepared it for Himself, deadly weapons. Why? In order to destroy the wicked eternally, He makes His arrows fiery shafts. And not just an arrow that will plunge into the torso and into the soul of the sinner, but God first lights the shaft of the arrow so that when it hits the sinner, the fire will explode and literally burn the sinner. Fiery shafts set on fire like smoking missiles sent at the sinner. And as Charles Haddon Spurgeon says in Treasury of David, on this very verse, he says, and God never misses the target. Here is God in His holiness portrayed, pictured as the divine warrior in a state of declared war against humanity. This is an aspect of the holiness of God of which we need to be reminded and there should be trembling within our soul. that the bow has been turned away from us, from where it once was. Come to Psalm 9. Again, please note where Psalm 9 is, early in the Psalter, laying the necessary groundwork and foundation to understand the holiness of God, and these are worship psalms. These are worship songs that were sung in the corporate gathering of God's people. There was no hesitation on their part to sing of the vengeance 
of God. Verse 9, Psalm 9, verse 5, you have rebuked the nations, nations plural, all of the nations of the earth. You have denounced them. You have destroyed the wicked. You have judged them and sentenced them to eternal damnation. The verdict has already been issued. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. You've wiped them out. They will never be heard from again in the courts of heaven. They are plunged down into the lake of fire, submerged in flames. Verse 6, the enemy, the enemy of God has come to an end. It's over. It's finished. In perpetual ruins, ruins from which he will never recover. And you have uprooted the cities as though they're just a mere weed. And you just uproot them and cast them into the fire. The very memory of them has perished. This is holy. God. And there was no hesitation by the saints to sing this to God. Look at Psalm 11, verse 4. The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord is always in His holy temple. He is always presiding over the affairs of this world. He has never forsaken His executive responsibilities. He is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. He sees into every life. He sees into every back room. He sees into every dark alley. His eyelids test. The word test here means to, to, to examine, to, uh, to scrutinize, almost like the squinting of the eye to bring it more sharply into focus. And God, who is omniscient, sees into every life. His eyelids test the sons of men, all of the inhabitants of the earth. None escape His penetrating gaze. Hebrews 4 verse 13 says that all things are laid bare before the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Verse 5, the Lord tests the righteous and the wicked. The Lord sorts it out perfectly. He sorts out the wheat from the tares. He sorts out the good fish from the bad fish. He sorts out the wise virgins from the foolish virgins. He sorts it out. And the one who loves violence... His, God's soul, hates. Again, it's not just that God hates the sin. It's that God hates the sinner who is in his sin. God hates everything about it. Verse 6, upon the wicked, whom he hates, upon the wicked, he, God, 
will rain snares. There will be a deluge of wrath. Fire and brimstone. Holy fire. Hell fire. And burning wind. The psalmist adds, and burning wind, because the wind, when it blows, exasperates the flames and causes the flames to to rise higher. It, It causes the flames to be exponentially greater and hotter. He will rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. This is what they will inherit. This will be their eternal portion. Verse 7, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. It's the opposite of His hatred of sin is that He loves righteousness. The upright... Those who have come to Him in humble repentance and have believed upon His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who have turned away from their sin and who have confessed their sin and who have repudiated their sin and who have denounced their sin and have turned to His Son, the anointed, the Lord Jesus Christ, and thrown themselves upon His mercy and who have been clothed in His perfect righteousness and declared righteous before God through the act of justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, the upright will behold His face. This is known as the beatific vision. This is the greatest blessing of every blessing that can ever come to to any one of God's people. It's not just to be in the New Jerusalem. It's not just to walk streets of gold. It's not just to drink from the water of life and eat from the tree of of life. It's not just to have a crown and to cast it back at His feet. Those are all glorious blessings, but the blessing of all blessings, the blessing that rises to the highest level is the beatific vision to actually behold the beauty of His holiness. And He is so beautiful and glorious in His holiness, it will take 10,000 times 10,000 times 10,000 years to even begin to adore and to appreciate the flawless, perfect glory of God. What will that be like to behold the face of the one who is holy? Holy, holy. We come to Psalm 15, which I believe was read last night. The emphasis on the holiness of God continues. It's a thread that is woven through the tapestry of the Psalter. In Psalm 15, verse 1, O Lord, who may abide in your tent, who may dwell on your holy hill, who may come into God's presence, who may be received by holy God? Verses 2 through 5 tells us, It is only one who is holy. He who walks with integrity. The word integrity means wholeness. Their life is not fragmented where there's one person on Sunday and somebody else on Monday and someone else on Friday night and someone else on Saturday night. No, there there is a comprehensive completeness about their life before God. That's what the word integrity means that all the parts of their life are in alignment with God and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. There's a twofold understanding of this. The first is 
that those who have believed in God, like Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. He has been declared the righteousness of God and clothed with the righteousness of God and all of the riches of grace have been transferred to his account and he now stands perfectly righteous before God because of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the first level of meaning. That's the only one who comes into the presence of God. And then the second level of meaning here is all who are justified are being sanctified. The narrow gate can only lead down the narrow path. You cannot go through the narrow gate and walk the broad path. It doesn't work that way. It's a broad gate and a broad path, a narrow gate and a narrow path. And if you'd like to know which gate you went through, answer this question, which path are you walking? Because everyone who is justified by faith and who enters through the narrow gate can only go down one path. And that is the pursuit of holiness Hebrews 12, verse 14 says, Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And so what the psalmist is saying here is, the only ones who will enter into the courts of heaven are those who have been justified by faith, and they give evidence of that justification by their progressive sanctification. Psalm 15 is very potent and very strong. Psalm 22, verse 3, you are holy, O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Psalm 46, 4, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. Psalm 65, verse 4, we will be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. Psalm 71, verse 22, you are the Holy One, Psalm 78, verse 4. You are the Holy One, Psalm 89, verse 18. You are the Holy One. Look at Psalm 99. I'll slow down a second to let you find Psalm 99. Gas break, gas break, gas break. Psalm 99. I want you, I want you to to hear the reoccurring anthem, the th reoccurring theme is at the end of each stanza. The Lord reigns. The devil doesn't reign. Man doesn't reign. The nations do not reign. Circumstances do not reign. Death does not reign. There's no such thing as good luck. There's no such thing as bad luck. There's no such thing as a random occurrence. There's no such thing as an accident. There's no such thing as good karma, bad karma. Those are all pagan myths that have no existence whatsoever. As R.C. Sproul has said, there are no maverick molecules in the universe. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. Do we? He is enthroned above the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion. And he is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Next stanza. The strength of the king, the one who is seated above, loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in, in Jacob, referring to Israel. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at His footstool, meaning come and lower yourself and bow down before this king. At the end of verse 5, He is holy, or holy is He. Verse 6, Moses and Aaron were among His priests, and Samuel was among those 
who called on his name, they called upon the Lord and he answered them. He spoke to them in a pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies and the statutes, the statute that he gave them. Our, oh Lord, our God, you answered them. You are a forgiving God to them. And yet an avenger of their evil deeds, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill for explanation for holy is the Lord our God. It's repeated three times at the end of verse 3, end of verse 5, end of verse 9, holy, holy, holy. God is holy. God is holier than anyone. God is the holiest being in the entire universe. It's the holiness of God. And so this is the dominant theme of the book of Psalms, that we are to worship and ascribe honor and glory to the one who is infinitely, perfectly, absolutely, flawlessly holy. If this is how the psalmist says we are to worship God, this is God's own inspired hymn book, then let us rise up and ascribe glory to this holy God. Will you this day come to His footstool? Will you come and bow before Him? Will you humble yourself? Will you deny yourself? Will you clothe yourself with humility? Will you ascribe to the Lord glory and praise? Will you say, not unto us, not unto us, not unto us, O Lord, but to your name we give glory? I'm sure that that is in your heart if you are a true believer in Jesus Christ, because through the miracle of the new birth, God has given you a new heart, and you, like God, love righteousness, and you love holiness, and you hate sin, and you hate unrighteousness, because you now have new affections within your heart and soul. And as you grow as a Christian, you can no longer succumb to childish worship of God that is dependent upon gimmicks and is dependent upon all kinds of artificial stimulus to trigger your heart. No, now as you grow as a Christian, you put away childish things. You once spoke as a child and reasoned as a child, but now as you are maturing in the Lord, you must now speak as an adult to God and ascribe to Him the honor and the glory. And you no longer need to be in a church that's like VBS for adults. You now want to worship this transcendent majestic, sovereign, holy God. And that is the very pulse of your soul. That is the very heartbeat of your life. And you long to one day behold His face upon the holy mountain of Zion. You realize you're just an exile you're just an immigrant here. You're just a stranger. This world is not your home. You long for the courts of heaven. You long to hear the anthem sung, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth is full of His glory. You long to hear the trumpets of heaven 
You long to see Christ seated at the right hand. You long to have a crown for just one second that you can throw it back at his feet, signifying that all things are from him and through him and to him, to God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. May your heartbeat be the heartbeat of the psalmist. All glory to the Holy One in heaven. Father, thank you for these verses in the Psalms. Forgive us at times of our triteness, of our immaturity, of our infancy. May we continue to grow up and to mature and advance in our worship of you even while we are here upon the earth. May our minds and hearts be dominated with your holiness. In Jesus' name, amen.